Are you an anime fan? Then you probably like Madoka Magica, the series that brought together fans of Sailor Moon and Fate Zero, and spawned its own take on a classic genre that's now gone as far as Magical Girl Sight and Dead End Ages. Heralded as an instant classic by both casual and hardcore fans, it seemed this series could do no wrong. But have you ever heard anyone talk about the Monica Magica movie sequel? Even prolific anime tubers like Giguk and the Anime Man have said this year that they still don't understand Rebellion. Dislike I wouldn't mind, everybody has their opinion, but hearing any fan of Monica missed out on the beauty of Rebellion because of some differences in how the plot was explained saddens me. And those two were far from the first time I'd heard that. In fact, my impression from the anime community is that their confusion is actually the majority's reaction to Rebellion. So that's why today, I'm going to explain exactly what happened in Madoka Magica Rebellion. I remember when Rebellion first came out 10 years ago. Everyone had this negative reaction to it that, when explained, always came back to, I don't understand its confusing plot. Now at that time, we weren't far from when Inception was released, and boy, I remember how everyone who watched that movie told me that they had to watch it multiple times to understand it. Back then, as someone who had only watched it once, I thought this was ridiculous. Sure, you'd get more out of a second viewing, but it was pretty clear what happened in the plot by the end, minus the final cliffhanger. So my reaction to everyone else's reaction to Rebellion was, I'm sure they'll watch it again when they have time, and they'll get it when they do. And looking at Mal's ratings and rankings, I thought that's exactly what had happened. Sure, there's a lot going on in the story, but especially on a second viewing, you'd be able to follow it. This isn't like Ava or Lane where you're doomed without help from online wikis, and hell, if I could figure out Rebellion, I know you can too. So to those who never gave it another go, now's your chance to revisit it, since another installment is officially coming. But to those of you who did and still didn't get it, or just want to take this trip down memory lane with me, let's break down the story of how after Madoka became a god, Homura became a demon. To understand Madoka Magica Rebellion, especially if you haven't watched the series in the last 10 years, I'm going to first explain how the story of the original 12 episode series told its story. Since that one came out to universal acclaim just two years prior, I'm hoping that highlighting the dialogue for how and when things get revealed there will both refresh us on how we understood the TV run and help us clear up the movie confusion. So, let's get into it. Episode 1 of Madoka Magica opens up with two minutes of the final fight of the timeline we're about to leave to begin our story. <laughs> yeah, this is the one people understood. Madoka races through the witch lair stylized domain of Walpurgisnaught and comes to find Homura busy losing that battle again for the countless time. As Homura falls through the air, she sees Monica giving in to Kyubei's offer to become a magical girl. Then the timeline resets, and we see Monica in bed, who thinks some lingering memory of it was a dream. This confusing of an opening seems to be no problem, even though anyone watching it for the first time would have none of the context I just gave you, because all of this gets flushed out in a retelling of this event in later episodes. Because the movie doesn't have as much time as a full 12 episode series, retelling is not really employed in Rebellion. This isn't the main reason for confusion though, because we'll see in this TV series that diegetic narration is the main tool that's used to explain the plot, which definitely makes it to Rebellion. Both the TV series and the movie try to always put concrete spoken answers to the questions they raise, which is why the next installment won't be a Hidaki Anno retelling. Monica Magica goes on to show us what we later learn are key scenes in the build-up of Monica's decision on whether or not to become a magical girl. Who we later discover is the battle-hardened, all-grown-up, realist version of Homer that's been forged through countless timelines. This Homer keeps interjecting to either kill Kyubei or attempt to disillusion him in Monica's eyes to dissuade her from taking his offer. We learn that Kyubei will predictably approach Monica because he's drawn to her by his sensing of her immense emotional potential, which we have Homura to thank for. This is how Homura knows where to be and when to be there, with a slight variance as Monica's aura grows each time, and some events may differ slightly. But this is the most important plot driving structure in both the show and the movie sequel. Homura feels obligated to protect Monica, and to help her, she has to stop Monica from doing what she otherwise would choose to do. 
In the movies, we'll watch Homer become evil itself to carry out the same goal. But let's jump now to episode 9 in the series to explain what I mean by obligated. At the end of episode 9, we're treated to a scene where Kyuubei explains to Homer that he let both Kyoko and Sayaka die just to isolate Homer so she couldn't beat Walpurgis Knot without Madoka signing a contract to join her. This is a great example of how whenever the plot takes a backseat to focus on, say, how two star-crossed best friends die together to ensure neither of them go on suffering, the immediate next scene is a dialogue explaining what happened and the motives behind the main characters that weren't there. This show doesn't leave you behind, but it definitely leaves you wanting more, which is why after putting Homer in this impossible position, episode 10 makes an impact by taking us all the way back to the very first timeline where Homer first got her powers. In this episode, we see Homer stumble into a witch's lair and discover that Madoka and Mami are magical girls. She then joins them on their battle against Walpurgis Knot, and after Mommy is killed first there, Monica directly says to Homer that even in this doomed spot, she's glad she became a magical girl so she can help people like Homer, even saying that this is her proudest accomplishment. Now that's a lot of weight to put on Homer, and though she doesn't mean it like that, it's not the only time Monica does it. Later, in the third timeline where Homer tried telling them everything at the start, Homura actually winds up creating a scenario where her friends kill each other and leave only her and Madoka to fight Walpurgis Knot. When they lose that final fight, Madoka uses their last grief seed to save Homura from becoming a witch and dooms herself in the process. She then asks Homura to go back in time and stop Madoka from becoming a magical girl. Such an emotional moment between such close friends only creates a new dynamic for Homura where she no longer just has the wish of becoming strong enough to protect Madoka, but now it's on her to protect her from even becoming a magical girl in the first place. This explains why she was so standoffish in the main timeline the show followed, because these alternatives have proven to be counterproductive in other timelines. We're then treated to another timeline and where Madoka beats Walpurgis Knot, but in doing so becomes an even greater witch. <laughs> All of the narration going on around this may distract you from the spectacle of how incredible this twist is, but it's showing you again and again that Kyuubei's determination to get her to become a magical girl is because she's growing immensely strong, to the point where Madoka alone is now all that's needed to solve the entropy problem of the entire universe. It'll just take down Earth in the process. Just like in Rebellion, this is showing you developments you need to be taking in, but not being afraid to do so in the span of a twist being revealed and explored. Turning away from this bad end, we're then treated to Homer's reset of that opening of the episode 1 timeline to the current timeline where she meets Madoka after repeatedly killing Kyuubei to try to keep him away from her. The whole time, she's narrating to herself the multiple timeline dynamic, her personal motivations, and setting up her dynamic for how she interacts with her friends in the main timeline we've watched. It's like a Monica Magica Explained video, but done by the writers to make sure we're all on the same page and ready to enjoy the final plot developments. They even play the opening theme as the end credits for the episode, which really highlights that they always start with Monica crying. <laughs> This full-length recapping is, again, something that isn't done in as much detail in Rebellion, but we'll see how there are actually clean divisions in Rebellion's acts, and a particular full reset to the initial start of the movie before the final act. This gives us the same episode 10 effect of summing everything up to an initial status quo, so now you can just watch and enjoy what happens next. Now, let's go on to the end of episode 11, where Walpurgis Knot throws at and hits Homer with a literal skyscraper. Yeah, that looked like it hurt. And we see in fact it did, as she's partially pinned by rubble and bloody. She narrates to herself the guiding tragedy of the show of how if she goes back she's only going to add more weight to Madoka's fate. She's about to give in to despair when Madoka grabs her hand and tells her, that's enough. This line marks a turning point from Homer's suffering to now Madoka stepping up to protect Homura instead. This is an inversion of Homura's wish from her own contract. 
Now, a natural reaction to her implying that she's going to become a magical girl is the question of, is this just a doomed timeline now too? Which is why it's asked right at the start of the next episode. I'm telling you guys, they put in tons of explanations up front to make sure people don't get lost. But, this is Monica, so they're going to immediately slam you with another twist after that explanation, because this show doesn't slow down. Enter the central point of karmic destiny, aka Gautica. Monica wishes to erase all witches before they're born, a phrase whose specific wording has key ramifications for, and is in a sense the majority of Rebellion's entire plot, which Kyubei says could unravel space-time and make her a god. This is confirmed when, while conversing with her dead friends Mami and Kyoko in a last moment of dedicating herself to this decision, Mami says that she'll lose all traces of her individual self, and continue for eternity as merely a concept or a principle that destroys witches. We see this existence of Madoka named the Law of Cycles in the final scenes by the Mami of the Universe Rebellion takes place in. Fun fact, this is actually a Japanese pun on Madoka's name according to director Shinbo. As the reordering of the universe under this new universal law commences, we see Kyubei and Homura watching it with an explanation as to why they're able to witness it. It's probably just so we can watch it, but I appreciate the relentless dedication to explaining our potential questions to maintain the consistent in-universe logic of the story. But that's not all. We get more explanations for Kyubei and Homura discussing what this means for the universe, as well as Monica's fate, and the immense despair she must now bring too. This should bring about the same bad end as the third timeline, but on an even bigger scale, as instead of just Earth, this witch is now going to be on a Gurren Lagann universe spanning size. However, just as that's discussed, we watch Monica declare that by her wishes wording, she as a magical girl herself shouldn't have to despair either. And then she launches this barrage of arrows that destroyed the despair that was encapsulating the Earth. There's then a sequence of dialogue in this beautiful god plane of existence Homer followed Madoka to during this shift, where these ramifications are explained by a now omnipresent and therefore omniscient Madoka. She hands Homer her hair ties, beautifully symbolic of the red thread of fate from Japan's cultural lore, and tells her that she'll always be with her. It's like what you say to someone you love on your deathbed to ease their pain, Except in this case, it's literally true because she's becoming a god. Before Monica leaves Homura, she says these fateful words. I'm sorry I have to go, but I've got to go meet all the others. I'll see you again one day. This is basically rebellion right here. Because the whole premise of rebellion is that Monica meets you right as you're about to be overcome with despair and personally saves you from that fate making it as if you just disappear instead of transforming. That is now true for Homura as well, since she's carrying over to this new universe too as a magical girl. Almost the entirety of Rebellion is the story of that fateful encounter between Madoka and Homura as Homura is transforming. But before we fully dive into Rebellion, it's important that we cover the last bits here. This new world Gautica made is shown to us as having these glitching white monk looking things called wraiths that bring a miasma when they appear and are what the magical girls now fight off. Probably similar to how grief seeds were collected from fighting witches, in this universe curses are collected instead and Kyubei and his kind have a new strategy based around this that isn't detrimental to the magical girls to the point where Homura is now friendly with them. We'll see later that this scene is a critical moment for what's happening in Rebellion, as Kyubei's entire involvement in that film is spawned by his fascination with the potential efficiency and harvesting energy through this theoretical world Homer felt comfortable enough to tell him about. Lastly, we see Homer using Monica's wings and bow to fight the race, and in the post credits scene, her using her dark wings from Rebellion's transformation to fight them. This was probably a teaser of what would evolve into Rebellion as the writers more fully developed the story. I'll link to a wonderful interview about Rebellion with director Shimbo and writer Urobuchi in the description, which I recommend reading after this even if you don't still have questions. Now finally, what you all came here for. Rebellion. 
Much like the TV show, Rebellion opens up with a world you're not yet supposed to understand until it's later explained. The opening narration reminds us about how the law of the cycles will eventually lead all magical girls away when their fight is over. This should establish to everyone right from the get-go that this movie takes place in the world the series left us in. However, we instead enter into this world of nightmares, which is immediately apparent to the viewer as not the real world of the show or some type of distortion. I feel like this opening is what started most of the confusion about the movie that bogged people down to eventually concluding that they didn't understand. That opening sequence primes you to want to reject this world as the falsehood that it is, but you as a viewer are instead wondering about if the writers are retconning things or taking this franchise in a different direction. It's supposed to get the audience thinking from the start about what is or isn't real, but if you lose immersion you're going to miss the entire start of the ride. Even though this nightmare world we're in isn't the real world, Everything that's happening is real, and so it's important you're ready to go through Homer's same journey of discovery about the world and not be hung up wondering if you missed some significance from the cakey song. There's another great article that eludes me as of this recording where this opening nightmare world is described by either Urobuchi or Shinbo as their attempt to create a fun bubblegum world like they had originally advertised Monica being during its original run. That advertising was done to add a shock factor of the episode 3 twist where it's revealed that this show is really dark with Mommy's death. I think it makes this opening far more enjoyable to keep in mind that this is a fun fantasy of the Monica world as if it were a normal magical girl show, and not a sequence you need to exhaust your mind trying to keep up with. Also, first to link that interview in a comment will get pinned, so if you know where it's at, please do post below. <laughs> But back to Rebellion. This opening world we'll ironically call the Nightmare World, since those are what the magical girls fight, is actually Homer's fantasy of what she wished all of her friends could live in with her. The most lasting thing established in this opening half hour is Bebe, the witch they're now fighting alongside. Bebe is later shown as able to transform between her magical girl and witch form and entered this nightmare world alongside Madoka, who now carries all witches and magical girls with her as the Law of Cycles. Unfortunately for Homura, these battles are too different from how their real battles were, and this is what tips her off to the world not being real and causes her to slowly unravel it. To jump ahead for just a moment, it's important to keep in mind that this is a world that was created inside Homer's barrier, at her moment of transformation via the Law of Cycles, so anything here is under her subconscious control. When created, it was done consciously, but part of that creation was to wipe the memories of herself and her friends, so it's only her unconsciousness that's reflected now. You don't need that knowledge for the first half hour. But that's why as we get more answers about the world being of her creation, we progressively see it plunge deeper into decay. Pulling the curtain back on how and why it was created is antithetical to its creation, since her own memory loss is an integral part of her goal to experience this carefree, innocent existence with Monica forever. But alas, nothing gold can stay. The faces of the NPCs Homura created start to become blurred as Homura questions what's going on. Things from a witch's labyrinth and witch's familiars begin to be seen in the background just at the decision of Homura to vocalize these concerns to Kyoko. Kyoko was shown during the TV series to be very grounded in the grim reality they lived in due to her backstory with her failed heretic preacher father and her corresponding wish that only brought about more pain. This is why she approached the other girls in a turf war manner and was so nonchalant about farming grease seeds. This realist attitude is the furthest from the bubblegum attitudes they all have in the nightmare world and why Homer attempts to reach out to her first. There's a hope that if she can get Kyoko to realize something's wrong too, they can unravel the mystery together. However, on their bus ride, they only succeed in unraveling the world. Kyoko gets fired up when she realizes they're trapped in this version of Mitakihara City, 
and only agrees to pretend like nothing's wrong when she sees the two of them are surrounded by NPCs staring at them. As Homero puts it, they won't be in any danger so long as they play along. Which we later learn is actually true since it's what Sayaka's been doing. What's so funny about this though, is that it's not just Homura's right in that the world is structured to start attacking anything that would unravel it, but that Homura wants Kyoko to keep this between them for now, so she's subconsciously calling the NPCs to make her feel threatened and force her to do things Homura's way. It's not just the world, but Homura herself actively making the situation what it is just by being there in person. We later see that the world doesn't unravel if the other girls realize what's going on, proved by Sayaka having retained her memories from when she entered with Monica. It only unravels as Homura discovers the truth. Remember, this world is her fantasy of living a bubblegum magical girl life with her friends. So as long as they play along with that in front of Homura, everything will continue as normal. Homura takes off her glasses and undoes her braids, both styles only attached to her innocent mindset early on, and declares that without a doubt, this is a witch's labyrinth. And now, 40 minutes in, the real story begins. As Homer recaps witches and the law of cycles for the audience, it should be clear now that they're in a labyrinth, and Homer even explains that this must also be the reason for their false memories, just to put a pin in that for the viewers. Despite all this explaining, since the reveal here is contrary to what was being established previously, I feel like a lot of first time viewers don't catch up at this point and then get left in the confusion dust going forward. At this point, the only questions left for the viewer are supposed to be, where is the witch? And who else is real? With Kyoko staying normal while so much is unraveled around her, it seems safe to assume she's real like Homer. But what of Madoka and Sayaka, who were no longer supposed to be alive in this world? Perhaps that was why Homura was turning to Mommy next, who was supposed to still be alive just like Kyoko, but before she can pull her away from Madoka, who's at her house when Homura arrives, we cut to a shot of Homura death staring at Bebe. Ah yes, Bebe. The Witch. This shot alone should make clear to the audience what's about to come next, which results in one of the greatest fight scenes of all anime. I literally use this fight scene to test out new monitors and TVs, so if you're somehow this deep in the video and haven't seen it yet, go ahead and pause right now and type in Homura vs Mommy in a new tab. When you come back, comment if I'm crazy or that's a 10 out of 10 fight. Before we move on though, I think it's important to catch this moment where, while the three girls are talking about mommy's history with Bebe over tea, there's this moment when Homura asks her first probing question that picks at the world. Since this is out of character for bubblegum Homura, everyone kind of pauses for a second. The camera jumps between everyone showing their reaction before returning to Homura, who has this non-bubblegum look on her face, but then it briefly cuts to an extreme close-up on Kyubei's eyes. This will be the first of many, and though identical looking, will come to effectively portray different feelings. As the first moment where Kyubei looks anything out of the ordinary, this is very subtle foreshadowing of Kyubei's involvement first being hinted towards, and it even implies that Kyubei's memories are still intact the entire time. But this is subtle, so back to the fight. After declaring to Bebe that she's the only one who could have created this world, it's revealed that Mommy has one of her ribbons tied to Homura's ankle, so Mommy was pulled into the time freeze with her. For new viewers, this time freeze ability is illustrated to the audience through Homura's interactions with Bebe when she touches and releases her, just to make sure everyone's following. Homura attempts to explain to Mommy what's going on, but resigns herself to being unable to effectively communicate with Mommy, just like in the TV show timeline that resulted in Mommy killing Kyoko. After being unable to break her ankle tie, Homura asks if Mommy is going to protect Bebe no matter what. It's actually Mommy who declares that they'll have to fight if she doesn't stop, 
which is why Homer shows such hesitation and fear with her shooting herself gambit. She doesn't really know if this mommy will save her, but she thinks there's no talking to her now that they've fought, so her only option is to count on their bond still meaning enough to mommy to save her. This is why it's so beautiful to see Homer decide to switch from shooting mommy's soul gem to just a disabling shot in the leg. Even though she recognizes that mommy is so powerful that unless completely taken out she might still be able to stop her, which she actually does when time starts again, there's this moment of self-assuring resolve right before Homer pulls the trigger. It's like she's saying to herself, hey, she did just save me because she still loves me, so even if this is a harder line, I'm still going to do the same because for all our differences, I still love her too and want to save her from all this. Mommy calls this out as the reason for having a dialogue with Homer once she ensnares her. Just as Homer is breaking through by getting Mommy to bring up wraiths, Sayaka comes in to break up the conversation by rescuing Homer. This is important because it again establishes for the viewers that the world of the wraiths the TV series left us on is the one we're still in now. Unfortunately, since not a lot of time was spent in that world, this could have left some viewers feeling a little unsure of what's going on and what to expect. This is supposed to be a grounding revelation, but if you're still hung up from before, I can see how missing this could leave so many feeling confused for the entire film. Bebe returns to Mommy to explain everything in her magical girl form, perhaps for the first time Mommy has seen her this way, hinting that Bebe and Sayaka are both in the know of what's going on. Before we hear that explanation though, we cut to Sayaka and Homura. Homura calls out right away how Sayaka remembers everything, to which she replies, that's her role. Before that can be explored though, Sayaka calls out how the entire structure of this witch's labyrinth is different from anyone we've seen before, and in fact, different from why they're even supposed to exist. They're supposed to lure in victims for the witch to feed on, yet no one new is being brought in, and all the five friends are remaining unharmed while inside. I love the line she half says to Homura and half the audience, if you just stopped to think about it, you would have realized that. Which sideways acknowledges how the roller coaster ride thus far was supposed to distract us, with a spectacle and world of nightmares from these questions until this point. It also signals, however, that we're now getting back to the old style of Monica Magica, where the plot and world are consistently developed and explained. So viewers better buckle up from here on out. This is the moment where I think it's decided if you get the movie or not. Because everything from here on out assumes you're caught up, which hopefully you at least are now after watching this video. Sayaka goes on to explain how the witch isn't trying to lure victims in, but just maintain this nightmare world status quo. She tries to point out to Homura that the real question is who benefits from that, but has to cut herself off to stop Homura from escaping into a time freeze. Homura calls out that it's one of their friends and Sayaka confirms it by calling out Mommy's earlier comment on how this is the happiest she's ever been. Sayaka asks Homura what she'll do when she finds the witch who created the labyrinth, asking if she'll kill her just because she's a witch. This phrasing causes Homura confusion, since witches have been ingrained in her as her enemy from all the timelines she's been in. This is exactly the decision, though, that Sayaka and Madoka had to make when entering in and deciding to play along. They just chose differently, and so Sayaka tries to explain their reasoning to Homura, albeit indirectly. She asks if this is so bad since they're all safe and happy, and if the heart of a person that would wish for that really needs to be destroyed. She's playing devil's advocate to present Homura's decision to herself and to make her have to own that she's the one who's deciding against her own will. She must change her mind of her own accord, and the only way to do that without her memories fully back is through this conduit of Sayaka, who she renounces. It's a beautiful moment of a friend saying they'll support their friend no matter what they decide, and a clever devil's advocate argument representing the side of witch Homura, who later becomes a devil. 
Homer explains why Kyoko and Mami were able to remember and not remember the elements of the world that they did, since they both only knew the world of wraiths after the world was reset by Gattaca. She then declares that there are only three people who are here that shouldn't be able to be. The witch who created this labyrinth, Bebe the witch, and Sayaka who remembers witches. This logic isn't quite right, which is why Sayaka smiles and says this makes her sad. The three who shouldn't be here are Bebe, Sayaka, and Madoka, which, to get to this point, Homer shouldn't be able to miss, but she's so dedicated to keeping her relationship with Madoka alive that even as she unravels the world, she refuses to even consider the possibility that she can't keep Madoka with her. This foreshadows the fracture later on, but is a beautiful moment in and of itself, as it's so sad to see her put herself through this, but a sweet sign of how much she loves Madoka. This puts us as the audience in Sayaka's shoes of smiling, but saying it's sad. Since the audience may not have been able to put all the pieces together yet though, we have a whole additional act where Homura puts it together to make things clear for us on a first viewing. After disappearing, Sayaka offers Homura once more the advice that she should think long and hard about if she really wants to destroy this labyrinth city, because she doesn't want her to have any regrets. Note that it's because of her support of her friend and desire for her fulfillment and not having any regrets that this warning is given, but it falls on Homura's deaf ears as she discards Sayaka's cape to the wind. Homura recaps the situation and calls the wish of a fake, peaceful world where they're all happy, unforgivable weakness. She declares that magical girls must always continue to fight, before saying how this world is a waste of what Madoka sacrificed for them. This is sad because Madoka's sacrifice was to rid their suffering, and this conclusion that they must always fight even if it makes them suffer is actually contrary to her wish. That's why Madoka decided to play along in the first place. This labyrinth isn't causing anyone suffering, so it's in line with her wish, so she won't destroy it as long as it remains that way. It's ironically Homer's own refusal to accept a world where she can't have Madoka in true reality that causes her own suffering. And that suffering is what then makes the world unacceptable to all parties, because suffering has begun again. Thus, Homura has decided to herself that it's not just that she wants a world free of suffering together with Monica and their friends, but she requires that that world be the real world. This is the decision that will ultimately demand that the nightmare world cannot continue. Beyond what Saika asked her to think long and hard about though, this is not an abandonment of Homura's resolve to create that world. She just now must also make that the real world they're in. But before we get there, there's a nightmare world to unravel. The witches familiars start throwing tomatoes at a labyrinth wall, showing now that Homer's subconscious has aligned with this resolve, and even the labyrinth itself will now work to dismantle itself. We get an extreme close-up of Kyube intently watching Monica's interaction with Homer, again hinting that he fully understands the situation and is seeing that the labyrinth is collapsing. Homer has been trying to keep all this from Madoka as a way to protect her, just like she tried to withhold information from her during the TV series. But just like there, Madoka points out how doing so hurts her, because it's painful to see Homer suffering so much. This is what causes Homer to open up to her in the flower garden scene, because her first priority is always to ensure Madoka doesn't suffer. She tells Monica of the pain she's been through after she became the Law of Cycles, but begins the comment by saying this was all a dream to keep this veil of safety that if it hurts Monica to hear, she can just dismiss it as a dream. But Monica's emotionally stronger than Homer gives her credit for, just like in the TV show when she became Law of Cycles. She hears that Homer was so lonely and lost that she began to question her own memory. But instead of being hurt by having caused Homura pain, she instead goes to Homura to comfort her. She acknowledges that pain, but without her memories restored yet, she assures Homura that she'd never go somewhere so far away without Homura or their friends. 
Homer remembers that this isn't true, but Monica says she's so wimpy that she couldn't bear to do something that would make strong Homer cry like this, which is why we can't take this at face value. She just demonstrated that she's strong by being the rock in this position, and that same resolve is why in the ending episodes of the TV series, she became the Law of the Cycles even knowing that it would cause Homer a heartache. She's only able to say she couldn't because she's forgotten the pain and suffering the alternative would have caused everyone, and she currently only remembers the love she has for Homer. But even though we and Homer, who remembers everything, can know better in this moment, Homer doesn't want to know better. She desperately wants to justify her resolve to create a reality where they can be together and be happy, but she wants that to come from Madoka. If it doesn't come from Madoka's own words, as a renunciation of the world Madoka created from becoming the Law of Cycles, then to do so would be to go against Monica's wishes and therefore her happiness. Homer could never do that. That's why Homer frames the Law of Cycles world as something that would cause Monica pain, just to get her in this moment of her trying to comfort Homer to confirm Homer's goal is just. Which, unfortunately, she does. Well, specifically, Monica says she would never want to go somewhere that she can never see her friends and family again. Which is true, because at the end of the TV series, she assures Homer that since she's become omnipresent, she is in fact still there with everyone she loves their entire lives. But this nuance isn't what Homer is trying to understand right now. She doesn't want the truth. She wants a justification for her decision. Since these words are genuine, she can now proceed according to them, even if her interpretation isn't as accurate as it could be. This turning point is shown by the flowers wilting, as Homer declares that she should have stopped Monica from becoming the Law of Cycles in the first place. She acknowledges that she still doesn't fully understand what's happening in this world, but can sense that this is in fact the real Monica which is what is required if she's about to embark on her quest for a new reality. The doubt that Homer still clearly has is an interesting point of analysis for if she's just now willing to embrace a fake Monica as good enough for her, or if she actually can truly tell through the power of their friendship that it's really her. Either way, she thanks Monica for this one last moment of peace and happiness and then departs. This intentional misinterpretation and twisting of words and logic to justify a perverse motive is something that can be better followed and understood on a second viewing, and on an already confused first viewing could spin someone out even more. After another quick tease of the audience about keeping up with the twists, Homer explains to Kyoko that since Madoka is here, the only way this world could have been created is by someone who remembers her. She then leaves her soul gem behind as she rides off on the bus from earlier, which parallels in the TV show when Sayaka's body was left behind on a bridge as her soul gem was carried off on a speeding truck. This should cause her to lose connection with her body, and is the last thing she wants to confirm before ending this and troubling Kyoko no more by freeing her from this labyrinth. Homura passes the maximum distance and sees the labyrinth markings appear on her own body, confirming that she herself is the witch. The bus erupts into flames and explosions as flaming blimps collapse onto the burning city as the labyrinth takes its final form, abandoning the city illusion. This final form, of course, necessitates that Homura too takes her true form as the witch. We see the red flowers in contrast to the white flowers from the flower garden scene, along with many other symbols of Homer's final moments of despair, like the faceless NPC Homer Royal Guards. This confirms that the elements of a witch's labyrinth are reflective of their final causes of despair, just like we saw in Sayaka's witch form. Kyube reveals that he too has remembered the truth all along, and begins to explain to Homer and us what's going on in the Wraith reality. We're shown Homer resting on her soon-to-be grave next to an isolation field, 
designed to contain her soul gem as it transforms. It's unclear if this experiment was all Cubase doing to learn about the potential of this transformation, or if Homer was cooperative, which would explain why she looks so peaceful and without any signs of struggle. It's unlikely that an incubator would take such care in positioning her body this way, since it's not the focal point of the experiment. As Homer's outfit changes to signify her transformation into a witch, she becomes outraged at Cubay's use of her in this experiment. Cubay goes on to explain that the reason her friends could get inside is the isolation field prevents things from going out, but allows invited things to come in. This allowed her subconscious desire to bring in her friends and the Law of Cycles Madoka. We're also briefly shown that the Hitomi and Kyosuke in here were real, which is an interesting detail given the opening nightmare came from Hitomi. Kyube explains how he's identified that Madoka isn't from any past, unlike Sayaka and Bebe, and doesn't appear to be from any possible future either. Kyube therefore concludes that she must be the manifestation of the mysterious law of cycles he's investigating. As Homura continues to transform and become further outraged at Kyube, she calmly confirms with him that this means that this is the real Madoka, which gives her some solace in reaffirming that her plans are now justified. Kyube explains that it seems to him that Madoka lost her memory and powers upon entry, which is why the incubators couldn't do anything to her. Now that the world is crumbling, Kyube tells Homura to reach out to Madoka for help to avoid becoming a witch, which will trigger Madoka's memories for the incubators to observe. Assembling her faceless troops and familiars nearby, Homura, holding back her fury to ensure there's first no more gaps in her knowledge, calmly asks Kyube what his real goal is. After a sideways answer, Homura declares that it's too illogical a pursuit of an incubator to go through this trouble for mere curiosity, and that he must intend to be hoping to find a way to control Madoka. With one more of those close-ups on Kyube's eyes to silently confirm this, Homura is consumed with that righteous fury she can only summon when it's to protect Madoka, and begins a satisfying to watch onslaught against Kyube. Kyube goes on to confirm how they plan to revert Madoka's wish by controlling the Law of Cycles to allow witches to once again form, and asks why Homura is angered because in this process she'd be able to again meet with Madoka, which should bring her joy. This is perhaps why Homura agreed to help Kyube, only being promised a reunion with Madoka, without the details of Kyube's master plan as we so often saw Kyube manipulatively do in the TV series. Homura declares that this is not the joy she wished for, as we know that her wish is for that joy to exist in a stable, long-term reality. Her body continues to collapse into a witch, and Kyube realizes that the Law of Cycles may not be able to prevent her transformation if this continues. But this is precisely Homura's plan. She explains that in the original timeline she only became a magical girl to protect Madoka, and that she'd again give her life to protect Madoka now by becoming a witch instead of letting her be revealed to Kyube when she saves Homura. Resigned that she can't have her happy with Madoka reality, but can at least still protect Madoka from the incubators, Homura is ready for Mami and Kyoko to destroy her once she transforms, like a prisoner marching to the guillotine, which is why her witch form is shackled and partially decapitated. Kyube explains that dying here would mean she'd be destroyed and doomed to eternal despair, instead of getting to be saved by and remain with Madoka, which he thought would be the worst possible outcome for Homura. It's this ignorance of the illogical human emotions that led to Kyube's miscalculation, and why Homura begins to repeatedly destroy his bodies after her transformation completes. We're treated to a sorrowful countdown of her friends' reactions as they prepare to fight her witch form and are finally, an hour and a half in, at a world state that we can recognize from the TV series. Kyube rushes over to Madoka and Co. with a last-ditch attempt for her to unlock her inner power instead of fighting her friend. But Bebe and Sayaka, 
who have retained their memories following Garuka's plan to avoid this scenario, have already convinced Madoka to trust her friends, and she takes off ignoring Kyubei. We get one last bubblegum transformation sequence from the cheese-loving Bebe as the battle against Witch Homura begins. Kyubei is shocked to see how Bebe and Sayaka can transform and control their witch forms thanks to the Law of Cycles, which shows us when Gataka saves the magical girls, it doesn't prevent their transformation, but brings them peace from their sorrow and control over their new forms. It's told to Kyubei that Madoka and friends had anticipated Kyubei was up to something when they entered, so the plan was to store Madoka's memories and power in both Sayaka and Bebe to allow Kyubei to waste his time watching a blank Madoka while they could make sure everything was in an acceptable state without being noticed. However, the problem is instead of attacking her witch form like Homura planned, all of the magical girl's attacks are being directed upwards at the sky, slowly causing the barrier of the labyrinth to be shattered. This causes Witch Homura to stop her march to the guillotine, and only now to send her millions and familiars to attack them. Homura knows that if she's released from the barrier to be saved by Gataka here, it'll lead to the incubators later learning how to take that powerful Madoka away from her, and she cannot accept this. After a quick aside for Sayaka and Kyoko to hold hands, we see Madoka shatter the labyrinth barrier and reveal the incubator seal, with even more incubators observing from outside. Homura apologizes for betraying Madoka's wish in what is perhaps an acknowledgement of working with Kyubei to create this scenario just so she could see Madoka one last time. She embraces Madoka's wishes at last, transforming her red flowers of despair to a beautiful bouquet of Madoka pink, as the two of them fire an arrow at the incubator seal. Very importantly, in this moment Madoka asks Homura if she's afraid, and Homura answers that she won't hesitate any longer. This is a key insight into Homura's motives, as she abandoned her plan to become a witch and stop Kyubei, but will now follow her heart's desire at each moment, which right now just happens to be to embrace Madoka and shatter the seal. This isn't because she's going to trust Madoka going forward though, it's just to get that moment of embracing Madoka. This is how Homura will operate going forward. No hesitation, no compromise on the desires of her emotions. She will bring to reality what she wishes for in her heart, not through the incubator's contract, but by her own hand. As the seal is destroyed, the arrow continues into the air and unleashes a barrage of arrows on the field of nearby incubators, who declare in unison that they don't understand at all. <laughs> I feel like this got memed as the point where people felt so lost they gave up trying to understand. But really, this is meant to say that the incubators, who are emotionless creatures, don't understand how this outcome could have come to fruition even after seeing it themselves. This is because so many of the final decisions were made purely from the emotions of the magical girl's hearts. We then see Mami set the now freed grief-stained soul gem over Homura's heart as we see Madoka enter in her Gataka form. Worth noting all the people around the seal once it's broken were people who were trapped inside, and including their school teacher and Madoka's family. A nice touch to have the interactions with Madoka's family and her mom in particular during this movie be real thanks to this. Homer regains consciousness and sees her friends gathered around her. Madoka reaches out to Homer, saying she'll take her to be together with her from now on. This is hinted at as being the original end to the movie in an article I referenced before by Gen Rubuchi, but since the directors wanted the story to continue after this, they eventually brainstorm the twist we're about to see unfold. Homer replies to Madoka's declaration that they'll always be together from now on by affirming they will, and that she's waited so long for this. We see the smile of a Homura who won't hesitate to become evil itself to fulfill her heart's desire to live safely with Madoka. This continues the ongoing contrasting theme between her and Madoka as yin and yang, chaos and order, if the ends justify the means, and now, god and demon. Right before Gataka can reach Homura's soul gem, Homura grabs her hands and declares that she's finally caught her. 
Her soul gem begins to erupt with a radiance of dark-hued, iridescent colors that are described by Bebe as even worse than a curse, referring to the wraith equivalent of grief seeds. Reality itself begins shattering, creating barriers between Gautica and Homura and the other magical girls. It then proceeds to crack right through Gautica, separating the innocent Madoka schoolgirl and her powerful Law of the Cycles form. Homura reaffirms that she'll never let Madoka go again, and her soul gem completely erupts with a force that envelops the entirety of reality. We see a pink thread that Homura's familiars were playing with fall beside Homura, who shatters this new iridescent soul gem in her mouth. The thread then transforms into a form of soul gem we've never seen before, and Kyubei begins to explain to us that the world is being rewritten. He remarks that this must mean a new principle is being born into the universe, just like when the Law of Cycles was created by Madoka. This should all be very familiar to fans of the original show, despite how bizarre and abstract it is. Homura explains to Kyubei, who doesn't remember the last time he was in this plane of existence, what's going on. She says that in her mind, what was blackening her soul gem wasn't despair, but love. And this is not fully accurate because we see her fall in love with Madoka over the course of the TV run without the gem blackening, but instead only doing so when she begins to give up and lose hope. It is, however, ultimately due to her love for Madoka that she experiences this, so this perspective is not without merit, but warped through a despair that has, at this point, become integral to who Homura is. As Homura transforms into a form with wings, contrasting Gautica's bright color palette with a black and white simplicity, Kyubei asks what she's trying to become. Homura says Madoka had become as sacred as a god, but even so she undermined her and pulled her from heaven, and now the only name for such a creature would be a demon. Thus, Demon Homura, or Devil Homura, is born, Kyubei, laughably far too late, declares that trying to control human emotions is too dangerous, but is told by Demon Homura that the incubators have now become necessary for her plans. In my favorite rendition of the word incubator, we get a close-up of Kyubei that shows us a moment where, for the first time, that expressionless face conveys fear. We're then shown a new world, where Demon Homura and the creations of a witch blink in and out of existence as the magical girls innocently prepare for school. Mami and Kyoko interact with some of these creations, but Demon Homura, apparently still forming the new world, at the shake of her head alters these interactions. It's clear from this that Homura doesn't want any sign of her witch form present in the new world once she's done forming it. Sayaka then confronts Demon Homura, outraged that she's broken the law of cycles that magical girls rely on for salvation. Homura trivializes her concerns, saying that she's only broken off a tiny piece that was Madoka. She then states that she didn't intend to pull all of their friends into this new world with herself and Madoka, but isn't phased by it as she's become evil itself in this new world. She says that perhaps once all the wraiths are destroyed, the nature of whom is still a complete mystery to us, the viewers, she may then become the enemy of the magical girls. Very big hint there as to what to expect in the upcoming sequel that's currently in development. Then, at a mere clap of her hands, Demon Homura robs Sayaka of her ability to summon her witch form, also eroding her memories. She then declares that Sayaka would have no chance in standing against her in battle with such power. We then hear a line from Demon Homura that is reminiscent of what Sayaka had said to her back when she was trying to unravel her own labyrinth. Why don't you simply enjoy the happiness from getting another chance to live a human life? Sayaka declares that the one thing she'll never forget is that Homura is a devil which seems to only amuse Demon Homura. She says that Sayaka should pretend to be friendly with her in daily life, otherwise she may dislike Sayaka. 
Now it's unclear if that she means this fracture of Madoka, her beloved Kyoko, or someone else, but expect this to be something we see in the upcoming sequel, and don't take Sayaka's disposition towards Homura in the start of that sequel at face value. We then see our first real glimpse into this newly reset world, where Madoka has taken the role of the transfer student, and Homura has been there all along. Homura, perhaps subtly using her new powers of world manipulation, shoes their classmates away from Madoka and brings her on a tour of their school. Madoka's question of why she's being shown around is ignored by Homura, but becomes clear to us, as her probing questions about Madoka's memory reveals that the only thing around the school that Madoka feels has changed is herself. This triggers her to start remembering that she has a greater role as the Law of Cycles, and she starts to reconnect with that form, only to be snatched back to this new reality by the embrace from Homura. Homura tells Madoka that she already is who she truly is, and causes her Law of Cycles aura to completely dissipate. Homura, distraught by this development, asks Madoka if she treasures this world, and if she considers stability and order more important than desire. This is Homer seeking one last vindication that despite her near transformation back into the Law of Cycles that brings stability and order, Madoka actually prefers this new world of desire Homer has created for them. Madoka struggles with the abstract question, but despite affirming that she does treasure this world, she also says that she thinks it's wrong to break the rules just because you feel like it. Homura takes this to mean that she is Demon Homura, who has gone against the rules of the world to the point of completely rewriting the world, is therefore destined to become the enemy of Madoka as well as their friends. This is likely going to be the driving conflict of the new film, with Homura representing the side of innate human desires, and Madoka representing the rule of law for greater good. There is in this moment, however, a potential hint that the two may be able to reconcile before one is completely destroyed, as Madoka can't think of rewriting the whole world as inherently wrong, since she did it too. It'll just be a matter of resolving the discordance between Madoka's changing things for the greater good of all at great personal sacrifice, versus Homura's unwillingness to sacrifice the ones you love. We may be in store for more universe rewrites, as Homura says to Madoka that even if they become enemies, she'll continue to wish for a world where Madoka can be happy. But I'll leave all that speculation to you, and bring us to one final detail in the after credits scene, where in the field a very disheveled and pain-ridden Kyubei is seen twitching, with a close-up on his eyes now showing a pupil with distorted edges, implying that whatever demon Homura has changed about the incubators was not a pleasant experience. Hopefully that clears up any confusion surrounding Rebellion, and at the same time gets you all excited for the next installment in the franchise. I know I'm hyped for it, and I can't wait to see where this dream team of writers and directors take this story. Thanks to anyone who reached the end of this, and if you want to share this with someone who doesn't have the time or patience for this detailed of an explanation, I'm also releasing a companion video for this where I try to explain Rebellion in just five minutes. <laughs> I've yet to record that one, so wish me luck on that. Hopefully that'll be able to reach more people than this and get fans back on track for where we're at in the story. Thanks for watching, and keep enjoying anime.